So last week, we started on the topic of what do we come to church to do? And even before that, the couple weeks prior to that, we started talking about how the church of Jesus Christ, the true church, is laid upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. And so we started down the path of, is the church in America staying true to that foundation that the original apostles and prophets laid? Remember, there's a great distinction between the original 12 apostles and any apostolic gift that we have today. The, the apostles, the founding apostles and prophets were those that touched Jesus, that were eyewitnesses to Jesus, that heard with their own ears his teaching and his doctrine, those that witnessed his death and his resurrection. And so they laid the foundation, and hopefully we're staying true to the foundation and true to the cornerstone who is Christ as we continue to go generation after generation after generation. But as we know with human nature, a lot of times we slide off of that foundation and we're no longer in line with what Jesus intended for the church. And so a lot of what we're asking is, what do we come to church to do? Because, and I don't want to get all into it again, but last week we were talking about people come to church for a lot of different reasons, many different motives. Some come to find a spouse. Some come hoping that it's kind of a religious self-help club where maybe the quality of my life can improve. Some come thinking that if they honor God, God will give them earthly success and wealth and uh, uh, status and fame or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why people go to church. And so last week we talked about the fact that we come to church for one thing, and that is to pray. And by one thing, I don't mean that uh, there's not other things. That's what we're discussing. This week we're going to talk about the fact that we come to, wor to, to church to worship God. Last week we talked a little bit about you know, if we are this living temple that the scripture says that we are, who is on the throne of this temple? And sad to say, in many churches, man has been put on the throne. And it's all about man's status, man's condition, man's perceived needs. And I'm here to tell you today, according to the scriptures, God is on the throne in his church. And we are here to worship him and do service to him, to be grateful and thankful for everything that he's done and provided for us. He is the reason that we come and gather. And if we will truly lose ourselves in him, our needs will be met. But it's not about us and what we perceive that we need or what we desire. We are here to please Him and Him only. So we, we come to church to worship. Last week we talked about prayer. We're going to talk about worship today. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. The Apostle John speaks here from the island of Patmos. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So it was a day just like this. And he was in the spirit, meaning his focus, his comprehension, his sight, his vision, what he, what he was hearing, went beyond the natural realm. And he's seeing and hearing things from God. And he says, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, the seven churches that we've been studying on Thursday nights, to Ephesus to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven gold lampstands. And I think it's down in verse 20, you'll see it there in your notes. Those uh, lampstands are the churches, and each church is its own lampstand with its light and fuel that's burning. And in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man. And so this is creating the, the image, the vision here that Jesus walks among his churches. And remember Thursday night, you saw that little map of how these churches were kind of in a horseshoe shape. 
And so you can imagine Jesus being among them, walking among them, speaking to this person, speaking to that person, touching that life, healing this heart, you know, calming that person's mind. And he's just, he's here with us this morning in the same way. And he's moving among us, speaking, healing, delivering, setting free. And that's what makes this church. The church is not made up by its name. The church is not made up by any man. The church is not made up by the building it's in. The church is not made up by the size of the crowd. What makes this church is that you and I have come to give honor and glory and worship to Jesus and Jesus alone. And when we come in his name, he's here in our midst, just like he was in the midst of the lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, that's Jesus, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. And the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. We're going to see a passage here in Corinthians in, in a little bit that talks where Paul is telling the Corinthians, you're not worshiping some idol. You're worshiping a living God. When we come here, we are not coming to, to gather around a doctrine or a dogma or an idea. We're not coming to gather around a common hobby or interest in life. We're coming to gather around the throne of God and God is here in our midst this morning and he is alive and he is real and he has eyes like a flame of fire. He has a voice like the roar of many waters and he's here touching our lives this morning. That's church. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and those seven stars down in verse 20 or 24, somewhere around there, those seven stars he calls the angels of these churches, which most commentators, historians believe that um, the seven stars are the pastors, the overseers of the church. And I like the, the, the way that it says in his right hand he held seven stars. He's got the pastors, the leadership in his hands. At least they're supposed to be. Meaning he's in control. He's conducting his church. From his mouth came a two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. He goes on, and if, if we go all the way to the back of the book in Revelation 21, he has this vision, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is us. This is the church, the bride of Christ. And, you know, we, we can't totally figure it out in our head, but we're being formed as the temple of God. And here it's actually saying that us, this bride, the body of Christ, we are this holy city, the habitation of God, New Jerusalem. So what we're doing here this morning, this is forming and making us into what we need to be to be that bride, to be that holy city. And so who's here this morning is not an accident. You're in relationship with who, with the saints that you're in relationship to by the design of God as he's putting his church together. And so what we're doing today is just preparation for heaven. And some of you might be thinking, well, you know, I thought it was bad enough being in church with them. Do I really have to spend an eternity with them? Once you get up there, you won't, more, you won't care anymore, right? But yes, we are here being prepared as this holy city, the temple of God, and this is what it's like for the rest of eternity. Worshiping God, praising Him, giving Him service and honor and glory. That's what we're here for. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
We are the dwelling place. Do you realize as the church, there is nothing on this planet like us? There is nothing on earth where God inhabits like he inhabits us. We are special. We are the apple of his eye. Don't know why he chose us, but thank God he did. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. Don't you love the imagery of he will wipe away every tear? See, our God is active. As he's here in our midst this morning, he's wiping away the tears. He's mending the broken hearts. He's strengthening the weary. He's delivering us from sin's power and from addictions and whatever else we have going on in our life. When we come together to worship and praise Him, miracles take place. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being knit together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Verse 21 there, where it says, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple, he's talking about the church at large, the global church. And then he says in verse 22, in him you also. And what he's saying there is, yes, there is the global church, but in him, you guys in Ephesus. And remember, we're talking about... uh this was in the first century, and there were no church buildings until really the third century. And so this is a house church. In the beginning of the book of Acts, you see where the Christians kind of went to the temple along with the Jews, and everything kind of continued on as it was. But I tell you what, one thing that really ruined the church for the Jewish people is when the church started to accept Gentiles. And at that point, man, it was just all over for the Jews. The Jews really, you see a backlash, and, and the Jews really turned against Christians in a greater way than before. There was always tension there. But pretty soon, the Christians were not even going to the temple anymore, and they started to gather in small groups, just like this group, in homes. And so he says, the big church, the global church at large, is growing into a holy temple, but you guys also, you 12, 15, 20 guys there sitting at that house in Ephesus, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not just inhabiting the global church at large around the world. When you 12 or 15 or 20 guys come together in Ephesus in that house there, the Spirit of God is there. That is the church. And you're being built and knit together. And I emphasize those two phrases in verse 21, being joined together. And then in verse 22, you also are being built together. And notice God initiates who we are built with. And that's something that is kind of a mind bender for us today. But what it's saying is that if you are a Christian and part of the church, what church you go to, what Christian brothers and sisters you end up being knit with, that's all by the design of God. The mind bender is this. How, how do we reconcile what Paul is saying here with the American model that we see today where people, you know, if they don't like one church, they can just pick up and go to another church. And, you know, it's, uh, I just don't agree with everything in this church, or they just don't offer enough programs or activities. And this church over there offers me more, so I'm going to go to that church. And you kind of know how it is with the American church today. I, and I don't have an answer. In verse 21 and 22, I see a very clear principle that God ordains you into a specific church with specific people, 
with specific believers in your life that are going to encourage you along the way. And the whole 21st century American church of, well, I'm, I'm just not quite satisfied, so I want to pick up and go over there. I don't have an answer for that. I can't justify that. I, it's not what the Bible says. I do think that there are... You know, it'd be really interesting. Let me digress for a moment. Wouldn't it be interesting if Jesus came back this morning into this very room and he picks on Steve and he says, Steve, I want you to write letters to the churches in Fairfax County. And this is, this is what I... Now, what churches do you think would be on the list? Because I believe that there would be churches that are called churches that think they are churches, and they wouldn't get a letter. Because God probably would not recognize them as a church. I pray to God Westgate Chapel would get a letter. We might not like everything that's in it, but at least we'd get a letter, right? And so you just have to wonder. I, you know, I can't reconcile the dynamics of what's going on in the, in the American church today. I know that it's not like that in other nations. It wasn't like that in the first century. The guys in this Ephesus church meeting in a home couldn't get angry and pick up and go to the next church down the street. There was no other church. And so in that context, Paul was saying, you guys are here by design. God placed you in relationship with each other by his sovereign design. And we've got to believe that for ourselves, that we're here by design. And I'm not talking about, you know, it, this has nothing to do with big churches, small churches. I believe, I don't believe that big churches are wrong and small churches are right. I think there's a lot of big churches that are doing a great job. But all of the dynamics, like we've said before, of God's instructions to the church in the New Testament, it's all based on groups just like us. Small groups meeting in homes. And the things that the New Testament tells the churches to do are not possible in a big church. And I'll, I'll show you some of that in a moment. At least it gets a whole lot harder to do in a big church. But we're here by design. We're here on the plan, on the mission of God and how God puts us all together. You know, when I think about this, I think about Lisa and Dana in Texas. And I know that Tara and I have much more of an opportunity to talk with them and fellowship with them. But there is absolutely no doubt in my mind or Terry's mind and many of your hearts and minds, uh, Lisa and Dana are one heart, one spirit, members of this church, just as much as anybody here in the flesh this morning. And how we got connected was kind of through a freak occurrence of a one-time speaking engagement up in Pastor Hughes' church. And from there, we got connected and have been together ever since. But we are moving in one heart, one mind, one spirit with them and they with us. And it's a divine appointment. And I think... Because they're in Texas, I'm just highlighting that because of the geographical difference, that you can appreciate much more the fact that God put us together in a very supernatural, miraculous way. But you guys are here in a very supernatural, miraculous way. It's all the same. It's just because we're close in proximity, sometimes we don't always see the supernatural because we've known each other for 20, 30 years. We don't always see the supernatural, but it is supernatural as God is building us into this habitation. So number one, God inhabits this temple. Number two, God's temple is for worship and service. It's not to cater to man's perceived needs or his carnal desires for his success. How, where, when we are joined together is God's design, not ours. And God's design of how, when, and where we are joined together is it's not just earthly, but it's eternal. As we saw in Revelation uh, chapter 21, it's eternal. We're going to be hanging out with each other 
forever and ever and ever and ever, and then forever some more. So this is where we learn how to love each other down here, right? He says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Well, because I'm taking too long with this, Look here at Romans 15, and then we're going to jump over a lot of other verses and get towards the end. But Romans 15, verse 5, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. Now, we won't mention any names, but evidently, living in harmony with some of us here in the room takes great endurance (laughs) and encouragement. Just joking a little bit there. But some relationships are tough. And relationships take enduring with one another, being patient with one another, being willing to overlook the faults and the weaknesses and the failures of one another so that we can live in such harmony with one another and in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice do what? Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says to protect the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep that bond of peace in our relationships so that we can harmonize and sing with one voice, one heart, praise and honor and worship unto God. It's all based on our relationships with one another. So our relationships with one another become a real vital, integral part of our worship of God as we come together as His church. And so I'm going to skip over a lot of these verses, and let's move on to um, let's move on to Romans chapter one, verse eleven. It's probably back towards the middle of page three, maybe in your notes. Romans chapter one, verse eleven. Paul is speaking to the Roman to the Roman church here, the church in Rome, and he says, "I long to see you, that I may impart to you somewhat." some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And so as we come together to worship God, what begins to happen is He inhabits that praise, Scripture tells us. When we gather in His name, Jesus is here in our midst, and He begins to minister to all of us through each other. And we say things and do things and care for one another in such a way that it's an encouragement to us and it brings life and strength to make it through life. That is, that's what he's trying to describe here. And then here in 1 Corinthians is this passage I was mentioning. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, and remember Paul said, I'm longing to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. So see, instead of coming to church to find my spouse or to improve my quality of life or to fix my problem, I'm supposed to be coming to church because I want to give to you. I want to minister to you. And I'm speaking as me, not just as the pastor. You are supposed to be coming to church to minister to others. It's not all about you. First and foremost, it's all about God But then as we're worshiping together in this environment of worship, God gives gifts. And he wants you to use your gift to minister to others here in the room. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Verse 2 is what I was talking about. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. And he's going to go on to say the God that we worship is not mute. When we come and we begin to worship God and praise God and thank God and exalt God, God does not just sit in silence. He's here among us and God talks back. And he talks back through these gifts that are used to minister one to another. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, but not, you're not 
serving a mute God. You're, you're serving and worshiping a God who talks back. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So when someone comes up and encourages you and says, hey, Jesus is Lord, and they're speaking by the Holy Spirit, that's God talking back, affirming the praise and the worship that we're giving him. Then he says in verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts. There's lots of different ways that God talks back. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for what? The common good. And so verse 7 forbids any of us from saying, well, I just, you know, I'm just here to soak it all in. I don't really have anything to give. What does verse 7 say? To each, to you, is given the manifestation of the Spirit in a gift for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. You know, what we call the word of wisdom. What is a word of wisdom? A word of wisdom is that pearl of spiritual truth spoken at just the right time when it's needed. I remember there was a time, I think it was after service or before service, me and Sal and one or two other of the men, we were talking in the aisles here, and we were talking about something, I forget what we were talking about, but it was something that was of concern. It was something happening here in the fellowship that was bothersome, that was somewhat alarming. And so we were expressing concern and so forth, and Sal spoke up and he said, all I know is that God is in control. And when he said it, it was more than just Sal talking. There was an authority, there was a conviction that came through Sal's voice. And I immediately heard the voice behind his voice. And, you know, immediately all of the cares and the worries left my mind. I was at peace because I thought, you know what? That is right. God is in control of this thing. I don't have to try to fix it solve it. I don't have to try to explain it or understand it. I can just leave it with God and be at peace. That's a word of wisdom. And I think the word of wisdom happens, operates through a lot of us many times when we don't even realize it. Yesterday, Terry and I were in the car going up to Woodstock. And again, we were talking about something going on here in church which I won't elaborate with any details, but we were talking about it, and, and Terry said, she said, you know, she said, when this happens, you need to do this, this, and this, because if you don't, then that will happen. And because um, if you don't do it this way, it's just going to open the door for that to happen. And again, it was one of those times where I heard the voice behind Terry's voice, and it was a word of wisdom. And it wasn't a bossy wife trying to set her husband straight. It was God speaking. And as soon as she said it, I thought, my gosh, you're right. I see it now. And that's what the word of wisdom is. You might be in a troubling, confusing time in your life, and someone, they... at I think most of the time they don't even realize what they're saying or the impact that it's having, but it's like a knife that cuts straight through the fog and the haze that you're in. And you see clearly as if someone just shined a spotlight on everything. That's the word of wisdom. It's wonderful when that happens. And we need to be open to that. To other, the, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. How many of you, and I think every hand could go up, how many of you have been woken up in the middle of the night saying, pray for so-and-so? And you didn't know what it was for or what was going on, 
but God spoke to you, there's a problem, there's spiritual warfare, there's a need, you need to pray now, and that is knowledge that you had no way of knowing other than God speaking to your heart. That's the word of knowledge. You didn't know what was going on, but God did. To another faith by the same Spirit. We all get discouraged at times, right? And we get weary and worn out. And sometimes God just sparks a supernatural energy in someone's heart, and they speak it, and it just livens everybody in the room. There's an excitement. It was a supernatural, yeah, that's right. Why are we so down? God is on our side. And it's just, it's not anything new. I mean, it's a, it's always a principle that we've known all of our Christian life, but it's just spoken in just the right way with just the right passion and fervency at just the right moment. And all of a sudden, hope re-enters your heart. That's the gift of faith to another gifts of healing by one spirit. Thank God for the gifts of healing. When you're in pain or when you are sick, sometimes it's hard for you imagine to imagine being out of pain. And when you're just so sick, it's hard for you to imagine what feeling healthy is like. And you need someone that can see through the situation, see through your pain, see through your sickness, and say, yes, God can even heal this. He can even heal you. And again, it's a divine, it's a divine insertion of God into the situation. To another, the working of miracles, to another prophecy. Prophecy is one that I think is great. Like, uh, you know, Kevin spoke out this morning and he spoke out last week. And what that prophecy does is the prophecy takes biblical principles and it makes it so real. It, 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 prophecy has a way, and again, it's nothing new. It's biblical principles that we are all aware of. It's kind of like, and this may be a kind of a crude analogy, but it's kind of like Hosea, when Hosea married the, um, the harlot. Remember that? And you think, why on earth would you do that? Why on earth would God tell you to go marry a harlot, right? The problem was Israel knew the doctrine. They knew the law. They knew God said, thou shalt not worship any other god. But they ended up worshiping other gods and didn't really see what they were doing. They didn't, they obviously did not discern their guilt. And so God had to place an example right in front of their eyes that said, you know what? You know this man of God, Hosea, married to a whore? That's what it's like for me, Israel, being married to you. And it's like, oh, we get the message. And that's what prophecy does. This gift of prophecy will speak God's word and God's principles. You know, it's like Nathan and David, when David didn't realize the sin he had committed, well, I think he realized it, but he, he was just kind of skirting it under the table with Bathsheba and Uriah. And then Nathan shows up and he gives this parable and he talks about this guy that had this little ewe lamb and someone came and stole the ewe lamb and David said, ah, it's not right. Let's make this right. And Nathan says what? You're that guy. And all of it, that's what prophecy does. And, and, and I don't mean that prophecy is always in the negative or in the corrective like that. It can be. But it can be in the positive too. It's like when Jesus went to, uh, Mary and Martha's house after Lazarus died. And Jesus said, and again, I'm paraphrasing things probably very poorly because of my memory, but Jesus said, do you believe that he will rise again? And I think it was Martha, wasn't it? I think Martha, either Martha or Mary said, yes, I believe that one day there will be a resurrection. And 
you know, it's going to happen in the sweet by and by. And yes, Lord, I think that's going to happen someday. And, and what did Jesus say? He said, listen, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is here before you now. Lazarus can be raised this very moment from the dead. And that's that spirit of prophecy where you speak into the present situation. You speak God's word into current events and say, this is what's going on here. And like David with Nathan, like Israel with Hosea marrying the harlot, like Mary and Martha when Lazarus died, all of a sudden the scriptures come alive. And it's like, oh, this really is real. This is here and now. That's what the spirit of prophecy does. That's why A.W. Tozer was considered a prophet, because he, he warned about the dangers of what was happening to the church, because he could, he could see beyond all of the activities and see beyond what everybody was doing and what was going on, and he could see the church is going astray here, guys. And it's that ability to see through the fog through the situations, through the circumstances, through all of the busyness and clutter to see what's really going on. That's the, that's the, the, the gift of prophecy. And then tongues and the interpretation of tongues, and I didn't mean to get so far into detail with this stuff. You know, we see here, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a what? A hymn? And so I'm going to finish here in a moment, and everyone's going to come to the microphone and sing the song that you've prepared to sing this morning. Not really. But I say that to kind of jolt our minds. Look at what he says. When you come, everyone is to have something to bring. A hymn, a lesson, a revelation. I think, uh, you know, when... Susan many times sings out a song that's not by chance. God has laid a song on her heart. And it may be a song that we sang 50 years ago. But again, like the gift of prophecy, there's a message in that song that's for right now that God wants to bring us to remembrance. And it speaks to our heart and it encourages us. You know, sometimes one of us will, some of us will read a psalm or a chapter or verses out of the Bible. The same thing. You've probably read that scripture a hundred times before. But that doesn't matter. God wants you to bring that lesson to us because it's for today, this very hour, and it's going to speak life into the situation and edify the church. A revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three, at the most three, and each in what? In turn. And one thing we'll talk about more next Sunday is I think we've done a great disservice to the church by setting things up like a theater. I really do. And you might think I'm crazy, and maybe I am, but... Um, you know, when we started setting up chairs in rows all facing the stage, we turned church into a spectator event. When instead, church is supposed to be the members coming together, each one bringing something to give. And it's... Now, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong or evil about having a sanctuary set up this way. That's not what I'm saying. But in the mindset, today we have so many celebrity pastors, and the band and the musicians are so professional, and the presentation is so flawless and slick, and we think that's God, and it's not and so here in verse 27, it says, let them speak in turn. Everyone coming, having something to bring. And if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. 
Now, Neil is someone, he moves in the gifts of interpretation of tongues, right? How do you know that? You know that because you know Neil. You go into a church of 500, and you're thinking, okay, I want to, I want to minister in tongues, but I don't know if someone's here to interpret or not. You see why I say uh, the instructions that Paul gives to the church, the bigger the church gets, the more impossible it becomes to follow those instructions. For you to know whether there's someone here in the room that can interpret the gift of tongues, you've got to know the people that are in the room, which means it's going to be somewhat limited to size. And if you look around and, oh, Neil's not here today, then let him keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion but of peace. So there's an orderliness that this is supposed to take place in. And I think in a couple uh, teachings down the road, well, you know, the, the teaching of God's word from a pastor or teacher is kind of center stage in everything. That always takes place. Remember when Paul preached so long that the guy fell out the window? And So if the good news, if, if my teaching puts you to sleep, you don't have far to fall, <laughs> right? Except for Terry, she might fall and roll down the... But uh, So we'll study and take a look at this more next week. We're out of time for this morning. Father, thank you for the word of God to us, and thank you for how you've ordained and designed the church to be. Father, we want to be... We want to be in a church that gets one of those letters from Jesus. We don't want to be a church that's not even recognized by him. We want to do things your way. Father, forgive us for the selfishness and the covetousness and the pride of man of coming to church to get for me when we're supposed to be coming to church to give to you. Father, correct our hearts in that matter and give us that heart that as we worship and exalt you, you will be enthroned in our midst and you are not a mute idol. You are a God who talks back. And when we come to worship you and to exalt you, you're going to talk back to us through a prophet with a word of prophecy. You're going to talk back to us in the ministry of speaking in tongues. You're going to talk back to us in a song that you lay on someone's heart. That is not just some little ditty that someone had in their mind. That, that song is God speaking to you in this moment of your life. You've got to see it as that. So, Father, we thank you for how we come to worship you. And as we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh to us and you engage us and you begin to talk back to us through these gifts that are here in our midst. Father, help us to see the miracle and the supernatural at work in all of that. Go with us now and keep us safe and protect us. Bring us back tonight to seek you in prayer. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.